Greetings, this is Danny Diaz, and we're going to be taking a look at the TCEA 2013-2014 game, Rubble Trouble. Rubble Trouble is played on the same kind of mat board that you've been used to. It's the Race Against Time mat. We're going to be using game elements very similar to last year. We're trying to get the most out of your purchase of checkers and PVC couplings. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have your robot. Uh, some things that we'll get into a little bit later are some of the new elements that you have in this year's game, which are the team-supplied game pieces. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about those, like I said, in just a few minutes. But let's go ahead and introduce the game for those who, uh, who potentially don't know much about the game so far. The game is played on this mat. This is the Race Against Time mat. The orientation of the mat is very important. The orientation is... Of course, you'll have the circle there in the middle. You'll have the dots, the alignment pieces uh, with the double arrows along the side next to the wall. You'll have the area where you've got this square that's sort of divided in half. That'll be um, towards the, the southern end of the, the competition table. When you look at the competition table, you'll look at it similar to a compass rose. The center of the board is north which means that the side next to where the robot starts, which is called the robot start zone here, this is next to the south wall. And then, of course, you've got the western wall and the eastern wall. The competition game is consisted of five of the PVC coupling tubes. So you'll have five tubes. You'll have ten each of the black checkers. There's two checkers there. 10 each of the black checkers and the red checkers. Let's go ahead and show the game setup. So once you start out, the game will be, the, the game field will be not set up. It'll be completely however it's, it's done. You will take the PVC couplers and put the PVC couplers on each of these target zones on the mat. There's five target zones. You'll put a PVC coupler on each target zone. You'll have 10 checkers. You'll take six of the checkers, put them into groups of two, and put them crown side up on top of these PVC tubes. Now the PVC tubes need to be in the middle of the mark, and these, couple, these checkers need to be crown side and crown side. Both sides need to be crown side up placed on top of the center. Now only the, the PVC couplers inside of this black circle get the black checkers. So there'll be three stacks of two inside. Then what we'll do is we'll take a look at, we'll pretend this, these weren't actually here. We'll take the rest, so there's a bunch of, bunch of additional checkers. You'll take each of the rest of the checkers and put them crown side up on the first mark, so that's mark number one, the first mark, the third mark, the fifth mark, the seventh mark, and the ninth mark. Now, at this point you should have four black checkers left and five red checkers left. Now what we'll do with the red checkers is we'll actually give that to the team that's competing. The team that's competing will potentially use these later on in the game. So that will go over to the team that's competing. And then the remaining four checkers, you're going to split them up into two groups of two. Now the two groups of two, you're going to find a mark that does not have anything on it yet. This mark here, the tenth mark, is going to be completely unused this game. So you'll pick, you just by random, one of these remaining four marks. So let's choose this mark. And you'll put two checkers on it. What's important about this is that the checkers are centered along the width of the mark and that the two checkers don't touch each other. So anywhere you want within that mark, and so we're going to choose this one. No, we're going to choose this one. There. So this is a legal setup for this game. It's very important that the game is set up correctly. The setup on the opposing side of the field has no bearing on the setup of this side of the field. This is different from previous years, where previous years 
this side had to be a mirror image of the other side, but that's not the case here. So this is a completed competition field, ready to play. Now, let's talk about some of the areas of the field that you'll be playing on today. So the first area that we're going to talk about is where the robot actually goes. That is this square here. So let's actually take a robot that we have set up. This is the TCEA Roverbot, sure, we'll call it that. The Roverbot will be placed in the, the starting zone. The wheels for the robot, the drive wheels, which are these two, the two paws in the front, the drive wheel, one, at least one drive wheel has to be inside of this box, touching the mat inside the box, and some part of the robot has to be touching the back wall. And of course the robot has to be 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches uh, maximum in any orientation. The, the orientation completely does not matter. If I decided to orient my robot like this, I can orient my robot like this. That's completely fine. So any orientation. And so I'm going to orient it like this so that my robot's tail is touching the back wall and his drive wheels are touching on the inside. Okay, this is the robot start zone. Uh, the next area that we'll talk about is the safety zone. So let's talk about the safety zone. This area in this, this big rectangle is the safety zone. Now the safety zone is very important because that's where you want to take the red checkers, these red FAM uh, food and medicine checkers. Now the robot has to take the checkers to that zone eventually if it wants to get points for it. Um, but only, you can only take one red checker at a time. So the robot can only ever be in contact with one red checker at a time. The same goes for the pillars, the PVC pillars. The robot can only ever be in contact with one PVC pillar at a time as well. So teams have to balance how to do everything that they want to do in the game with the amount of time that they have in the game. Because you only get two minutes in a competition game. So it's very important that teams weigh how long something is going to take to get done versus how many points it's going to be actually worth in the end. All right, so this, these target locations here are known as safety pillar sites. So these PVC couplers are known as safety pillars. Now the safety pillars are going to be used to hold up the warehouse. So this area here is known as the warehouse. The big rectangle here is known as the warehouse. Now, the warehouse has these um, uh, warehouse sites. What did I call them here? I don't remember exactly what I called them there. Let me take a look. Ah, weakened structure marks. So these are weakened structure marks, places where in the warehouse where the warehouse is weak and needs support. And so you will take a, uh, a pillar, you can take this safety pillar and pull it over into an empty area. If I take this safety pillar over to a mark that already has something on it, it is not worth any points until it is the only thing that's on the mark. And all it has to be doing is just touching the mark. So you'll want to take it to an area where there's nothing there. And the safety pillar has to have nothing on top of it. Now notice that the, two safe, the, the three safety pillars in the center have debris. So the black checkers are known as debris. These safety pillars have debris on top of them. So you're going to have to remove the debris and watch for falling objects. So you'll take the debris off however it is you want to take the debris off. It's completely up to you. And then take these to this area. And we'll talk about more what points things are worth and how to, how to maximize your points later. This is just for general knowledge right now. And then this circular area that all of this is in is known as the FAM drop zone. FAM stands for food and medicine, F-A-M. So it's the food and medicine drop zone. The food and medicine drop zone, if there are no items, even the robot. The robot counts as an item. 
as long as there are no items within the inner part of this circle, the team can then use their extra five food and medicine that are given them to them at the beginning of the tournament. They can take one checker and place it on one of these three marks, just one of those marks. And at this point, there's something in there, so they can't place another one. And then the robot can come in and grab the piece and then take the piece to that safety zone. Once this area is cleared out again, then the team may take another food and medicine and place it any, on any mark that they want. And then the robot can come in, send it over to the zone, and then come back out. Okay? All right. So we've talked about the areas of the competition field. Now let's talk about the challenges. So let me go ahead and set this field back up the way that we would normally have it. And then we'll go through each challenge one by one for the competition. All right, so the first challenge that we'll talk about is, of course, the one that um, is going to cause everybody a little bit of funness, which is erecting a radio tower. So let's talk about what a radio tower really is. So this is one of the team supplied game pieces. Now the team supplied game pieces are literally team supplied game pieces. These are game pieces that are built by a team. So what are they built out of? Well, that's a good question. It's actually built out of anything that you can build a robot out of. You can build them out of Lego pieces, you can build them out of cardboard, tape, string, uh, popsicle sticks, whatever you want to build them out of as long as it is still allowed within the, the allowed materials, which is the administrative section, allowed materials, you can build it. Now, of course the allowed materials says as long as it's under five dollars, you can generally do it. So we're going to take a handy dandy uh, Expo whiteboard cleaner and we're going to add that to our bill of materials and that is going to be considered our radio tower. So we're going to put the radio tower on the robot. All the team supplied game pieces have to be with the robot at the beginning of the match. And then we're going to take, well let's just go ahead and start off with this and we'll talk about the other piece here in just a little bit. So we've got our robot and we've got our radio tower on the robot. Now, Let's go ahead and add, just so that we're sure here, okay, this is going to be for one of the last missions. This is going to be one of our safety barriers. So we would add this to our bill of materials so that we would be able to have it as our safety barrier. Now you're not allowed to use your radio tower or your safety barrier unless it's in your bill of materials. If it's not in your bill of materials, you can't use it. All right. Now, all of these items have to be with the robot at the beginning of the match. And with the robot, the robot cannot be larger than 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. Now, I'm going to guarantee that this is within 12 by 12 by 12. If you want to actually do some math, you might find out that it, it might not be. But for the sake of argument right now, it is. It's within 12 by 12 by 12. Okay, so this is a legal robot right now. So the very first mission, and you can do these missions in any order, but we're going to talk about them in the order that they're in the, the competition game, is to place the radio tower on a wall. Mission 141, erect a radio tower. All right, so the radio tower can be placed on any of the three walls that are not the south wall. So remember, this is the south border wall. It's the one that the robot is touching at the beginning of the match. The robot will get no points for putting the radio tower on the south wall. But if the robot can place the radio tower, let's say the robot magically rink, puts the radio tower up on the western wall or magically places the ro radio tower on the eastern wall, you get 25 points. And that's where it stops. So you get 25 points for placing the radio tower on one of these walls. So there was a great question on the forum that asked, so what happens if the radio tower is touching two walls? Two, let's even say two legal walls. So this would be two legal walls. 
Well, the rules say that the radio tower can only be placed on a single wall. So even though that is touching two legal walls, that would not count because it must only touch a single wall. So this counts for 25 points. All right, now if the radio tower can be placed on the center wall, I don't know if you can see this in the video, okay, you can. If you can place the radio tower on the center wall, that is worth 50 points for both teams. Now, does that mean that the other team can abs do absolutely nothing whatsoever and score 50 points? Yes, it does. But what this is designed to have you do is cooperate with the other side in order to be able to get a shared goal. The shared goal is to put up a radio tower that everybody can use in order to uh, help save victims uh, of whatever tragedy that's going on. So placing it in the center allows both teams to take advantage of that. If you don't want to give the opposing team 50 points, that's perfectly fine. You can go ahead and place it on this wall for 25. Now what happens if there's one of these here for 25 and one in the center? Do you get 75 points? No. You get the least amount of points for this. So this team came in and said, I'm willing to share with you. And you said, I'm not willing to share with you. So you get the points that you scored, not the points that the other team scored. You get 25, the other team will get 50. Okay? But if you only place, if there's two of these on the center, how many points would you get there? You'd get 50 points. You only count a single tower. You only get points for a single tower. Now be sure to look in the rules for the state variation. So if you are able to move on to state, there's actually bonus points for distance between where the radio tower is and the, uh, the safety zone. So if it's within, I think it's six inches of the safety, oops, of the safety zone, then it would be worth a fairly sizable bonus. So teams will actually be, um, it'll be very advantageous for teams, for both teams, to place a radio tower up because one team's safety zone is over there and the other team's safety zone is four feet away over here. So both teams are going to want to put up a safety or a, a radio tower in order to be able to score those points. Okay, I think that should cover. Oh, the other thing to, to note is that notice where I'm putting that bottle of, um, it's a bottle of Expo whiteboard cleaner. That is our radio tower. Now the radio tower has to be fully supported by the wall. So let's say, is that fully supported by the wall? The answer is no. It's actually fully supported by the mat and not even supported by the wall. Well, what if I'm leaning it up against? Well, it's still mostly supported by the mat and somewhat supported by the wall. Well, what if I was to take a suction cup and suction cup something to the side? Would that count? Well, that would be definitely supported by the wall and only the wall. And then we would look at whether or not it was sticking up at least six inches above the top of the wall. So this is the top of the wall. The top of the wall is the same on all three legal sides that you can possibly be on. So you always measure from the top of the wall six inches. And as long as it's at least six inches up, then it's a, a legal radio tower. Okay, so we've, we've covered the radio tower. Remember, it must be in your bill of materials in order to use it and it must be a legal part, so it costs less than $5 uh, total for everything whatsoever, must be in your total of $5 in order for it to count. Okay, hopefully there, if you have any questions about this, absolutely go to the forum and ask. All right, so 142, task 142, remove safety pillars from FAM drop zone. So this is the FAM drop zone. These are the safety pillars. Pretty simple. All you have to do is remove those three pillars from the zone. So let's say we do this, we do this, and we do this. Are they out of the fam drop zone? 
Absolutely. How many points do we get? We get 50 points. This is, this is a, a Boolean, did you do it, yes or no? So are there any of the, um, the safety pillars in that zone? No. Now, what is considered in the zone? Is this considered in the zone? Yes, because it is inside the zone. Is this considered inside the zone? I don't know if you can see that very well, but the, the safety pillar is touching the black area, but not the inside white area. Okay, The zone is only defined by the inside of this circle. The black circle is not part of the zone. So this safety pillar, not touching any of the zone on the inside, is still outside the zone. Okay, so deliver FAM to safety zone. So what, you, what the robot needs to do in this game is actually take the red food and medicine and take these to the safety zone. Now there's five food and medicine on the board initially, and then if you can clear everything out of the center, Remember, if you clear everything out of the center, then you can then the team at any point in time can place one of their fam that they have with them at the start of the game on any mark that they want to, just one on any mark that they want to. And then then the robot has to be able to move these out in order for the next one to come in. Now, I'm moving these things around with my hand. What am I allowed, actually allowed to do during the game with my hand? Almost nothing. There's only two things. My hand is allowed to place and drop a fam, if that wasn't there. It's allowed to place and drop a fam. And my hand is allowed to grab the robot. My hand can grab the robot and bring the robot back to this zone. I'm not allowed to nudge the robot. I'm not allowed to nudge pieces. I'm not allowed to nudge anything whatsoever on the board or grab and replace something on the board. Your hand does nothing except place, if this in area is empty, it places one fam onto one of these three spots or grabs the robot and brings the robot back to the starting location. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about, and remember, only one fam can be transported by the robot at any given time. Okay, if the, let's say the robot is moving along and it grabs the first, it grabs the first checker and then is moving along and ends up, is that touching? Is one checker touching another checker? The answer to that is the checkers are touching, but the robot is not touching that second checker. It's not, the robot is not physically in contact with that second checker. But if that second checker comes over and touches the robot, then it is. As soon as the robot is touching more than one fam, more than one red checker, the robot has to stop what it's doing. The robot has to be placed back in the robot start zone and the two checkers or three or four or however many checkers it was touching have to be removed from the board and placed in the referee's pocket so they get permanently removed from the field of play. Okay, That also includes any of these safety pillars. If the robot is in contact with more than one safety pillar at any time, the robot stops, goes back to the start zone, and we take these off the board. And the robot suffers a penalty. We'll talk about the penalties in just a little bit. So now let's talk about the next mission, which is to remove the, okay, we got the safety pillars out. We've already removed the safety pillars from the FAM drop zone. Um, now we're going to talk about supporting the weakened warehouse structure. We've already kind of talked about that. So you take the safety pillars and you bring them onto these marks. All they have to do is just touch the mark, and you got to have, and then you get ten points per mark, and you get 
a 50 point bonus if you can get more than three or more touching those marks. For three or four marks touching an upright safety pillar. So is it possible to get one, more than one safety pillar on a given mark? And the answer is no. So even sitting outright, it's impossible for one safety pillar to touch more than one mark. So the point is, if you have two safety pillars touching the same mark, that still only counts as one safety pillar touching a mark. Okay, they've got to touch in their own marks. So we, right now we have three touching, we have two touching, we still only have two marks touching safety pillars. Read the, the description and the rules, it helps at least explain some of this. And then we have three again. Now what if it's touching an area that already has something in it? That doesn't count. It only counts if there's only a safety pillar touching the mark. If anything else is touching that mark, then it's not worth any points. But if the robot were to come over and knock that out of the way, then magically he's got his own mark. And so this would be worth 30 points plus a 50 point bonus, so 80 points. If you can get all five on there, it's worth a total of 100 points. Deliver the fam to the safety zone. We've already c covered some of this. No matter what the robot has done on the field and you want to go through the, the game and decide what order you're going to do things because the order matters here. If you do things while the field is, is not chaotic, then you can guarantee that you know generally where things are, especially the fam because the fam, there, there's five fam on the field that are in known locations. So at the beginning of the game, everything's in known locations. Later on in the game, maybe not so much. So you want to take the red food and medicine and place it into the zone. Now, did I get that into the zone? No, I did not. To get it into the zone, it must physically be within the area marked of the, the mat. Now, does it have to be touching the mat? And the answer to that is no, it does not need to be touching the mat. So this is still considered in the zone because I am still within the space defined by the zone. And so the zone is the area marked by the mat projected upwards to infinity. And so this is still within, that is still within as well. All right, let's talk about containing rubble. Now remember the black checkers, they're known as rubble. These are dangerous items to safety workers. Now remember there are six of these rubble in the, uh, the, the, uh, the center of the board. On, there's two on each safety pillar at the beginning of the match. Plus there's four more in random spots over there uh, in the warehouse. Now what you want to do, you can have more than one if you want. You can have as many safety barriers as you want. But there's, the way that you do this, and there's two ways to solve this mission. The first way, to, let's do it the easy way first. The first way to solve this mission is to have your robot suck up. Go gobble, 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 gobble. And contain rubble within the robot. Now what does it mean for the rubble to be within the robot? It just means that the rubble is touching the robot, but not touching the mat. Pretty simple. So all the robot has to do is just contain the rubble, meaning that each rubble that is not touching the mat, but is touching the robot, then you're good. All right, so the checkers in this, each checker in this configuration is only worth five points apiece. So you only get a total of potentially 50 points by taking all 10 checkers and pulling it into the robot. Or you can contain the rubble. Now let's get our containment mechanism. This is just a simple pin uh, uh, bucket, a pin bucket. Now I'm putting it on the robot like this for now. Pretend that the robot is a lot more sophisticated and the robot has the ability to take the pin bucket and come over and then take the pin bucket and contain the rubble. Now, it, you don't have to have a top on this, okay? 
in order to contain the rubble, you would put something around the rubble. So let's say if you had a bracelet, but it must be all the way around the rubble. So if I take paper and put it over, that would be containing the rubble. It is around the perimeter of the rubble. And any rubble that is contained within this is considered contained. You get 10 points per rubble that is contained. Now, notice that um, if I were to do this, then it's contained. If I do this, is it contained? Well, if you look at it, the lip is around the outside of the rubble. So it is around the perimeter of the rubble. I didn't say where on the z-axis it had to be. I just said it had to be around it. So there's one example uh, in the, on the forum where I talk about, well, if you have the halo, so let's say your checkers found religion, uh, and there's a halo that's, that's above, and you're able to put the halo in your bill of materials, then as long as the halo is surrounding rubble, then it counts. So that would be considered uh, surrounding the, the, the checkers, the perimeter of the checkers. If I had a, just a, a circular bit and just surrounded it, that would be good. If I had triangles or squares or rectangles surrounding it, that's good too. So be creative on your safety barriers, but it must be all the way around your perimeter. If you had a C-shaped object, a C-shaped object, and it wasn't completely surrounding the perimeter, is that good? No, it's not. It must be an enclosed perimeter all the way around the, the rubble. And let's move on to the last area, which is to empty the warehouse. So the warehouse, we want to empty the warehouse, meaning that it's completely searched. I mean, we want to get all game pieces except the safety pillars out of the warehouse. So right now we've got safety pillars. We've got three safety pillars plus four rubble plus one, two, three, four fam in the warehouse. The robot wants to move all this. Okay, there were five fam in there. We want to move everything out of the warehouse. Remember, the warehouse is this line here. We'll move everything except the safety pillars out of the warehouse. Now remember, order is very important. Okay, order is very important. So when you're thinking about this game, think about the order in which you're going to do things. Then do them, and then see how many points you get. All right, so the rules are fairly simple in this game, um, for the most part. Uh, the team start out, everybody starts out with 100 points. You, the robot has to be in its starting configuration at the beginning of the match. During the gameplay, and this is where referees have to be watching this game, during gameplay, the referees are going to be watching for you touching the robot. That's pretty much the only thing that either you touching the robot or you putting fam into the, the area. Well, all this has to be out of here, um, over there. And if this thing is all the way cleaned out with the robot, and then you placing that into there. If you recover the robot, okay, and so let's say the robot is out and about, and then he gets stuck. And you say, oh no, my robot is stuck. I need to get my robot and bring my robot back. You can bring your robot back and you incur a touch penalty. Now the touch penalty in previous years was a certain number of points that you got and taken off up to a certain number of touches. Well, this year your touch penalty is time. Okay, and the time is the number of seconds that you have touched the robot. So let's say the robot goes out in your game and you grab the robot. That's the first time you're touching your robot. From the time of the first touch, so you touch the robot, the referee starts counting in their head. One Mississippi. That's one. And then once they, they, they've passed their one second, then you can restart your robot. So pretty much 
the first time you touch your robot, because you only have a one second penalty, your second penalty is already up by the time you get your robot back to your starting location. That's pretty simple. Your second penalty, let's say your robot then goes out, you grab your robot and you bring it back, that's, your, that's two seconds. So as, as you grab the robot, the referee will say one, two. And so probably your first three or four times out, you're not gonna really feel a penalty whatsoever. Your fifth time out, your sixth time out, your seventh time out, you're gonna start feeling that penalty. You have to wait for the referee to indicate that you can go before you can actually start your robot back up. So that would, so once you get to 10 seconds, you're pretty much eating up, you've already eaten up, you know, 10 factorial uh, amount of time on your game board, which is, you know, you've already eaten like, what, 40 seconds-ish um, of time on the game board, so uh, almost 50 seconds. So you're, um, you've already eaten up a lot of time, so you definitely don't want to be doing that. All right. Um, that's the recovery and the wait, the wait period. The next thing we'll talk about is, of course, um, containing the robot, containing the rubble within the robot. We've already talked a bit about that. Uh, rule 205 specifically says what it means to, to contain um, uh, rubble within the robot. That just means that the rubble is touching the robot, but not touching the mat. So that checker would be considered contained within the robot. Um, this checker would not be considered contained within the robot. This checker leaning up against the robot would not be considered contained. But this checker, these checkers on the dog's nose would be considered contained within the robot because it's not touching the mat, but it is touching the robot. Um, when the robot comes back to the starting location, your robot is disabled, is considered disabled, until you start your robot back up. Well, once the referee says that it's okay, and you start the robot back up. While the robot is disabled, you can reconfigure the robot however you want. This is rule 206. It talks about um, that the robot, you can do whatever you want with the robot. Now, in previous years, if the robot was, let's say, three feet long and four feet wide, then you just bring the robot back, make sure it's in the starting configuration, and go. Well, now the robot, when you start your robot, your robot has to be within 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, okay, before you can restart your robot. So the robot cannot, at the beginning of the match, expand out to three feet, and then you bring the robot back, still expand it out to three feet, and start the robot back up. Your robot has to come back within 12 by 12 by 12 before you can restart your robot. And that's gonna be potentially a tricky area that teams that don't read the rules are gonna get tripped up on. Your robot must come back to that, so you have to make sure that it's very evident to the referee. If the referee cannot tell that the robot is still within 12 by 12 by 12, the, ro the referee may have to measure your robot and that's time that's being taken off your game. So you need to make sure that the referee understands that your robot is within that size constraint. All right, so f let's just very quickly, um, field variances and game debris. So occasionally this mat, this field will not be uh, the same way that it's gonna be at home. The mat might be a little bit wavy. Now right now we have these curls up on the sides this will be taken care of at the competition site. They'll usually put some kind of double-sided tape to hold this down so that it doesn't trip up the robot. But the area underneath the center board might not be the same that you have at home. Okay, there is a gap under the center wall. And that gap is a design consideration that we have so that the mat can fit underneath the wall. But at competition, there's no specific size that that gap has to be. So be very careful about that. Anything that comes over into your field, let's say there's a team on the other side and they dump a bunch of checkers onto your side of the board. Well, the referee will figure out what checkers weren't yours and try to get those off your side of the board as quickly as possible. 
Okay, you can ask to have the referee take that off. You can leave them there, but you won't get any points for them. They're really just an annoyance to you. Um, two, rule 209 talks about you're only allowed to carry one safety pillar at a time. Uh, rule 2.0.10 says you can only carry one uh, fam, one food and medicine. Now what happens if the food and medicine are touching each other? They're really close to each other. And you go to grab them. You have to be very careful to only grab one. If you accidentally touch two with your robot at any given time, remember, your robot goes back over there, you get your time penalty, and we take these off the board. Okay, so be very, very careful with checkers that are really close to each other. We may have to remove those off the board. Uh, and then, of course, remember, if the FAM drop zone is empty, if this drop zone is completely empty, including the robot, the robot cannot be in this zone, then if you have additional FAM in hand, then you can place one on any of those three sites on the board. All right, and the state championship variation, I will let you guys read the state championship variation, or we can talk about it on the forum if you'd like to. If there are specific scoring examples that you'd like to have demonstrated for you, um, let me know. Right now, the scoring examples section of the manual is completely empty because nobody really seems to have a problem with um, figuring out how to score this. That might be a good thing, or it might not be a good thing. Um, let's cover one or two more small things. So in the very beginning of the, the game, remember your all game supplied elements have to be on the robot. Okay, So we have our, uh, our safety uh, barrier on the robot, and we have our radio tower. And these are the two elements that we're using for our radio tower. Now, if the robot goes out on the competition floor and then you grab the robot, are you allowed to bring these two items back? Well, these two items are considered with the robot. They're part of the robot as long as they're still with the robot. If they're, once they're not with the robot anymore, they're not considered part of the robot anymore. So let's say your robot goes out and then it drops the it completely drops your uh, radio tower. Can you grab the radio tower and bring it back with your robot? The answer is no. Once the radio tower is no longer touching your robot, it's on the field. It's a game item on the field that you are not allowed to touch with your hands. So you have to be very careful with game supplied pieces. Once the game supplied pieces are no longer touching the robot, they're not with the robot. Now what happens if the robot goes back out and touches the item again. Are they then with your robot again? The answer is no. It is not with your robot because they've left, that at some point during the game, they've left your robot, which means they are game pieces on the field that cannot be touched by you. Now the robot can reach over and grab these items and take them over to where they need to go, but that's only if your robot's smart enough to be able to handle that. All right. Anything else that we um, that we failed to cover? Which there's not a whole lot that we've um, that that's really here. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the forum, check it out. Uh, if there's anything else that you want to talk about, go ahead and go to the forum, and, and we'll talk about them. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>